2023 meeting and officially call the meeting to order. And if Elder Mary Cherry would come forward, and she is with Kingdom Impact Global Ministries. And if we would all stand, and after she finishes the invocation, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Elder Cherry. Good evening, everyone. Gracious Father, we come before you thanking you for the many blessings you have given to us. Thank you for the new mercies we see each day, and thank you for your loving kindness that you give to us so freely. For these things, we give you praise. Father, you said in your word that we should pray for all those in positions of authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and guide these, your people. I pray that you will provide the council with clarity so that they can successfully address each item on tonight's agenda. Assist them in developing successful tactics that will allow them to progress as a team in a meaningful way. I pray that you will assist them in developing effective strategies that are practical, long-term, and simple to implement. Assist them in determining the best course of action to achieve all their objectives. Let them be effective and decisive. Spirit of camaraderie, please fill this place as we work together on their shared mission. Father, bless us and keep us. May your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. For everything that is accomplished here tonight, we give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Elder Cherry, uh, tell us about yourself and your ministry and your church. <laughs> um, like I've said, my name is Mary Cherry, born and raised here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, military dependent, dad and all the brothers um, were uh, retired military. Um, I graduated from Pine Forest High School uh, <laughs> in 1973. This is 50 years that we've been out, I've been out. Um, I am one of the associate elders at Kingdom Impact Global Ministry where my pastor is Chief Apostle William T. Ford. This is my first time being here and I've watched on TV before, but it's totally different being in here. And so I'm honored to have been asked to give the invocation tonight. And thank you all, and God bless you all. Thank you, Elder Cherry. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Council Member Hare. Thank you, that Elder uh, Cherry and our ministers together at Kingdom Impact. And it was so good for her to come and hopefully we have a few more coming that I reached out to. So thank you for giving her the opportunity. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Ingram has an announcement. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I would like to take um, privilege and extend. Um, first, could the Fayetteville Detour Poetry Slam teams come up real quick um, if they are here? so they can see you. All right, give them a hand, thank you. All right, thank you. So you guys know that I come from an artist background. Um, I would like to offer a big congratulations to these individuals um, who are a part of our Fayetteville Detour Poetry Slam team. Last weekend, cities within North Carolina and other states traveled to Fayetteville for the Detour, uh, Detour Poetry Slam at the Cape Fear Regional Theater, where they advanced to nationals. And I am proud and excited to announce that a historic achievement was made um, that Fayetteville North Carolina is now ranked fourth in the nation. Um, 
Yeah. Thank you guys so much for, for, for all that you do and continue to bring people to Fayetteville and go out and spread your art with the world. Thank you. Secondly, um, I would like to thank you. Secondly, I would like to um, announce that this weekend, three Fayetteville natives received Tony Award nominations and two of those nominations made history with Jay Harrison Gee and Alex Newell, who were the first non-binary identifying actors nominated for a Tony Award. And Jay Harrison Gee, Fayetteville native and E.E. E. Smith graduate, won the Tony Award for Best Performance by an Actor in a Leading Role in a Musical for their role of Jerry and Daphne in Some Like It Hot. Please give them a round of applause. And last, I would be remiss if I did not um, um, give them acknowledge. Um, over the past few months uh, at the Cape Fear Regional Theater, there was a, a play called Jelly's Last Gym that was um, uh, on display, you individuals stand that if you were a part of the cast. And they were faced with a, a hard narrative to share um, in this community. And they did it with such pride. And I believe really made an impact on Fayetteville, North Carolina. And so thank you for all of your work. Um, again, um, every the way you carried the roles that you did um, is just an amazing. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for the work that you do. And as the Arts Council say, we are the arts. And thank you so much for being here and just doing what you love and being you who you are. Remember. Council Member Hare, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come to you. Another announcement uh, we have, Council Member Hare, please. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this young man down here, but I still wanted to salute Mr. Joshua Jones. He is our 4.1 GPA Westover High School graduate that had a let's just say a plethora of requests to come and join universities all over the country. And he chose a local North Carolina HBCU, uh, Mr. And he is a uh, ath athlete scholar. And I just want to give him a thumbs up, reached out to him today. I hope to have him real soon on, on my program. 4.1, good job, young man, good job. All right, now we're going to have a proclamation for the Fayetteville Annual Pride Fest. Uh, Councilmember Benevente, you're going to read, and then Councilmember Ingram, you're going to present. All right, this is a present mm -hmm. proclamation to Katrina Marsden, Katrina Blaylock, and Caden Blaylock in honor of National Pride Month. Councilmember Ingram. Thank you, Mayor Program Dawkins. Whereas the United States was founded on the ideals of equality, inclusion, and respect for all, but the realization of these ideals has been long delayed and often only obtained after years, decades, or centuries of struggle, culminating in civil rights legislation or rulings, including for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer questioning Americans. And whereas the month of June 2023 marks 54 years since the Stonewall Uprising, where an LGBTQ citizens of a variety of ages and racial and ethnic backgrounds rose up against oppressive laws and policing tactics that have been since found to be unconstitutional. And whereas the Stonewall Uprising is widely considered the beginnings of the modern LGBTQ civil rights movement, and the LGBTQ pride celebrations have occurred in June all around the country every year since then, and whereas June is nationally recognized as Pride Month, and whereas Fayetteville has a diverse LGBTQ population with a rich and varied history that includes people of all ethnicities, languages, religions, and professions. And whereas everyone should be able to live free from fear, hatred, or discrimination, whether it is based on race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, national origin, or veteran status. And whereas the achievements of the LGBTQ community will be celebrated in Fayetteville at Fayetteville's Pride Annual Fest on June 24th, 2023. 
now. Therefore, I, Mitch Colvin, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and on behalf of the City Council and more than 208,000 citizens, do hereby honorably proclaim the 26th day of June in the year 2023 to be in honor of Fayetteville Annual Pride Fest. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the great seal of the City of Fayetteville to be affixed this 25th day of May 2023. Congratulations, y'all. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to invite everyone out to our festival on May 24th. Uh, it is from 12 p. Our June 24th. It is from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. and it is open to everybody and a family-friendly event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Benavente. Now, Councilmember Hondros has an announcement. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I'm just reading from uh, President Biden's proclamation that was released May 31st, 2023. It was a proclamation on National Home Ownership Month. Uh, during National Home Ownership Month, we recognize the power of owning a home when raising a family, planting roots in a community, building equity, and passing down generational wealth to continue the American dream for generations to come. We recognize that a place to call home, regardless of owning or renting, is essential to a life of security, dignity, and hope. That's why my administration is committed to removing barriers to home ownership. During the pandemic, my administration took action to ensure people could stay in their homes. We extended foreclosure moratoriums for millions of households, provided financial relief for homeowners who had fallen behind on their mortgages, delivered nearly 11 million emergency rental assistance payments, and provided 70,000 emergency housing vouchers. We are taking additional steps to, making, to make housing more affordable. Over the past decades, rising prices have forced people to spend more than 30% of their incomes on housing in many places around the country, too often locking Americans out of the prospect of buying a home altogether. In February, HUD made annual mortgage insurance premiums cheaper, saving Americans with Federal Housing Administration insured mortgages an average of over $800 a year. The FHA also made it easier for first-time home buyers to qualify for mortgage financing by allowing underwriters to take into account positive rental history uh, to determine credit worthiness. At the same time, we're working hard implementing housing supply action plan with a goal of addressing and eliminating the root causes of affordable housing shortfall by 2027. That includes making it easier to build mixed income housing using low income housing tax credits. Today across America, there's a historic number of affordable multifamily in units uh, currently under construction. And my fiscal year 2024 budget calls for 175 billion to build on this progress. It would provide down payment assistance to first time, uh, first generation home buyers, helping make a key part of the American dream a reality. It would also uh, help the state and local governments fight restrictive zoning laws and other red tape that stalls new construction drives up housing prices. These actions go hand in hand uh, to work with uh, to combat racial discrimination in housing, including everything from ending the legacy of redlining uh, to addressing the cruel fact that a home owned by a black family is too often undervalued compared to the same kind of home owned by a white family. The Fair Housing Act bans discrimination against renters or potential buyers on the basis of race, but the study shows many Americans are still denied equal treatment in the housing market. That's why the Department of Justice and HUD are cracking down on discrimination and why the administration is taking bold action to root out bias. I've often said the middle class is not just a number, uh, it's a value set. Now, therefore, I, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., President of the United States, by virtue of authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do proclaim June 2023rd, National Housing Ownership Month. I call upon the people of this nation to safeguard the American dream by ensuring that everyone has access to the affordable home in the community of their choice. Thank, Thank you, you Councilmember Hondros. All right, now we that. have a very special announcement and it'll be led by Councilmember Jensen, joined by Councilmember McNair and Councilmember Benavente and some of the folks that went to Denver, Colorado, I think there was 28, there may have been more, that went to Denver, Colorado. How many? 27. 
27, 27. Council Member Jensen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, before I present this to the City Council, I would like, we are gonna have a bigger celebration and tonight we just wanted to let everybody know, but before um, we present our award to the council, I want everybody to know who Cece is. <laughs> Cece was our little star when we went to Denver, Colorado, and I want y'all to know how much the people standing up here love your city. Yes. Because Jody had us on a bus at 2.30 a.m. in Denver last night. So we flew in today. We've had two to three hours. We have dressed, even Cece was with us, and we are here. But we brought home the All-American City Award for 2023. We went on. Um, and we will be back at the next council meeting with our whole delegation, but we did have um, 27 people go with us. And I will tell you, if you would like to see it, it's on Facebook, um, All-American City Awards. Uh, you will see um, we're the second Saturday morning, sec um, late morning, and we're the second person. 11 minutes in. Uh, yeah, 11 minutes in, and the award ceremony. Um, I have been doing this a long time. I don't think I have ever been as proud as I was <laughs> last night when we went up there and got the ward. We have a great city. And when we left out of there, people were coming up to us saying, y'all have done so much, but we don't pat ourselves on the back enough. But we might not see it all the time, but other people are. Yep. So last but not least, um, our youth council, it was all about youth. Um, they killed it. Our Fateville Next killed it. We killed it. <laughs> Mary Kate killed it. And of course, Cece, everybody fell in love with them. But Olivia Cody from Northwood Temple, which is our secretary of the Fayetteville Cumberland Youth Council and the president of the state youth council, won the whole award for youth. Um, she won the John Parr Youth Leadership Award. All over the nation. So you will hear more about her. So thank you, Fayetteville. And we are going to present this. Council. And kudos to Council Member um, Banks McLaughlin. She came out and cheered for us. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Mr. Dawes, please come to the podium. The year before my dad became mayor in 1987, Bruce Dawes came to work for our city. And we've got a, a man that's a, a very special man for our city, a man that not easily and may never be replaced a man that has been through thick and thin and always knew the history and shared the history, especially with young people. And that, and that means a lot. And uh, from the mayor said, well, doggone it, Bruce Dawes is retiring. I went, no, he can't, he can't. But 
It's all official now. On behalf of the mayor and the city council, our city key and our coin proudly presented to Bruce Stalls in grateful recognition of his devoted interest and untiring commitment to the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina. Thank you for dedicating over 37 years of your life to our city. May 6th, actually it was 1985, 1985 through January 1st, 2023. But I've seen you around, so I'm, have we just not been paying you? We've not been paying. I worked for the county for about nine years prior to that. Okay. Well, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Look up there. I'm gonna give you the. Uh, thank you. Give you. I'm gonna have you look toward the camera. All right. I want you to say a few words. That time has flown by quickly. I went to work for the City County Bureau of Narcotics in 1976. After about nine years under the county, came to work for the City of Fayetteville. And I can't begin to name names, all the people that I've come in contact with that have helped me uh, do what I needed to do and what I needed to get done. In general, I'll say that the city workforce has been nothing less than outstanding in accomplishing my mission. I'll just throw two names out. My immediate supervisor, James McMillan with the Parks and Recreation Department, and the person that took my place, Heidi Bleasy, made my job both pleasurable and easy to do. And I'll still be around. I wanna thank you all very much for this award and uh, I miss it very much. Thank you. A great man, great man. Thank you, Bruce. We look forward to seeing you around. All right, city manager, do you have a report? Thank you. All right, council, moving to item 6.0, the approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, council member Hare, uh, second by council member Thompson. Seeing no discussion. Uh, we have a discussion. Um, yes, Council Member Ingram? It's a clarification. Are we not using our system this evening? I don't know. Uh, do we, we're going to give it our... All right. All right. So let's try to use the screen. So do I push this one? Okay. Okay. All right, um, no further discussion, ask for your vote. All right, that is unanimous of those present. Well done, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Item 7.0, the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Council Member Ingram, motion to approve. Is there a second? Council Member Hondros. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, ask for your vote. I believe we're missing one. I see. Councilmember McNair. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Motion is unanimous. Thank you, Council. All right. We are now moving to our public forum. This is a time that any city of Fayetteville resident may have input and a voice in what goes on in their city. Due to policy restrictions, the forum will not last longer than 30 minutes, and each speaker will be limited to only three minutes to address the City Council on issues related to the City of Fayetteville. Individuals wishing to speak at tonight's public forum should have signed up with the city clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. If you are here to speak on items that may be on tonight's agenda under the public hearing, we ask that you reserve your comments until that public hearing. So when your name is called by the city clerk, we ask that you come to the podium and clearly state your name and home address for the record. 
Then when you see the light located on the podium change from green to yellow, you have 30 seconds left to speak. When you see the red light come on, your time has expired. Again, due to policy restrictions, we are not able to extend the given time. With that being said, City Clerk McGill. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, we have eight speakers for this evening. Our first speaker is Ms. Anne Schrader. Ms. Schrader. Welcome, Ms. Schrader. Please state your name and your home address, please. Good evening, City Council. My name is Ann Schrader. I reside at 223 Stedman Street. I'm the founder and owner of Eco Solutions, a local sustainability consultancy here in Fayetteville. My ongoing talks have been to encourage a City of Fayetteville sustainability master plan that would align us with our federal, our state, and our tri-cities environmental, climate, and resiliency legislation and plans. This plan would also help our city become more unified and work together to help these critical and needed initiatives, to lead these critical and needed initiatives by example. Currently, Canada's devastating wildfires exemplify the accelerating and far-reaching impacts that these environmental and climate challenges have on the health and the well-being of our communities, our environment, and our economy. And right here at home, record-breaking flooding from Hurricane Matthew and Florence cost our state of North Carolina over $20 billion in damages, with many still trying to recover and like thousands of others my family's business was flooded waist high one block from this city hall working sustainably together also promotes a healthier more informed and resource efficient uh, city through innovative economical and best practice solutions. These include improvements in education and participation in our city's waste reduction and recycling, thereby responsibly mitigating our rapidly filling landfills. As a PWC citizen advisory member, we are working together to help improve our city's energy management through cleaner, greener education and innovation. That includes community solar programs for our city's commercial and residential customers. We are also working to protect our precious water resources from the Cape Fear River, already bearing the impacts from drought, industry pollution, and competition. And as a FAMPO citizen advisory member, we're also working to help reduce our city's transportation emissions through multimodal plans that involve driving less, driving efficiently, and driving efficient vehicles. In closing, Today's all-American city is a more unified and a sustainable city that harmonizes social equity, environmental stewardship, as well as economic prosperity. And I ask that we all come together and help lead these critical and needed initiatives by example. Thank you for your time and attention this evening. Thank you, Ms. Ray. Our next speaker is Mr. Chilenko Hurst. Mr. Hurst. Mr. Hurst, welcome. Please state your name and where you reside, sir. Good evening to the council and citizens. My name is Chilenko Hurst, 134 Bacary Drive. I'm here to address three topics. Recently, they renamed Fort Bragg to Fort Liberty. And I got to give pause and thanks to Mr. Isaiah Thomas, the policy officer for Black Vets Project, and those black veterans who stood up for the necessary name changes for the nine bases that was racist in this country. Clarence, not Clarence Thomas, Thurgood Marshall said it better than me. 
There are those who look like us and talk like us, but they are not us. That pertains to people, minorities, and especially those who have black skin do not know the history of this country. We honoring, we're supposed to be setting examples for our youth, but we can't set examples if we're not teaching correct history. Also, I want to bring up the matter of the homelessness plight. We just heard about 10, 15 minutes ago it was raining cats and dogs. But the majority of the homeless, whether they be veterans or regular civilians, still do not have adequate housing. Or we building other things in Fayetteville, rec centers and everything else. But that rain you just heard, cats and dogs, people sleeping out behind gas stations, under bridges. But we building rec centers. It's some veterans and regular citizens out there sleeping in that rain that we're going to be driving home at, going to get a hot meal. Also, I'm also, I noticed when I came up today to lend support to the OCS individuals who was out there in the rain protesting for the safety project for Cumberland County. I'm also slightly bemused that the individual that's sitting in a pro tem mayor hasn't even been eight months. You had disparaging remarks to say to women of color, but you've been rewarded. I'm not that dude. And lastly, it's been nine months when you had two individuals outside the building placed in handcuffs for naming individuals who were murdered by overzealous law enforcement. But the individuals who murdered those kids, them husbands, and those women, they were never placed in handcuffs. Thank you for your time, consideration, and once again, these individuals in that slave market downtown needs to be taken care of and tore down. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Our next speaker is Mr. Jordan Gill. Mr. Jordan Gill. Our next speaker is Ms. Bobby Burgess. Bobby Burgess. Mr. Rakeem D. Jackson Perry. Ms. Um, Jackson. Is this, uh, this is Bobby Burgess. Okay, okay, all right. Yes, I yes, ma'am. State your name and your um, where you reside, please. Okay. Before I get started, actually, I'd like to clear something up with the city clerk, if I may. I was going to speak on the budget for OCS today, and I think it might have been a little unclear when I wrote in the comments what I was trying to speak for, so I got placed in the public forum. Would it be possible for me to be placed in the public hearing at this time so I could speak yeah. at that point? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. That's what I want to speak about. Thank I'll be you. back later. And All yes, right. it's Miss Burgess. My name is Bobby. Clerk McGill, Spell please. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rakeem D. Jackson Perry. Miss Tracy Smith. Miss Tracy Smith. Miss Angela Malloy. Hello, Ms. Lamo Malloy. Please state your name and where you reside, please. My name is Angela Malloy, and my address is 131 Hay Street, Suite 201. Um, this is the public forum, because I'm speaking at both. So let me see which. All right. Um, good evening. And I would like to take this time to just talk about and thank the council, those that um, voted to not provide the lawyers for the officers that killed Jada Johnson. This was the right thing to do. Um, like one council member stated, uh, he was satisfied with the fact that charges were not filed. Another felt comfortable in providing funding for the um, officers to obtain counsel. Um, another vote confused me um, by the vote, but those of you who were not willing to make a decision without seeing for yourself 
if the actions of these officers were that of police protocol, did the right thing, and I just wanted to take this time to thank you. Um, we understand that uh, you know there was discussion about seeing a video. We just uh, appreciate that you were willing to receive more information on that. We in the black community, we know that the majority of the time, if justice is going to take place after an officer killing, it is rarely done in the, in the criminal court because of immunity. Uh, many have been left to depend on the civil court to seek some ounce of justice. So the mere fact that this case did not go to criminal court is not an indication that their employers should blindly provide legal counsel. Taxpayer money, my money, should not go to providing private counsel. This is a civil matter. If there are people out there who want to help pay for the officers who killed Jada, then let them provide donations, go buy fish plates, attend fundraisers, um, hosted by the Fayetteville Police Foundation. But the city should not be providing counsel without having more information. I know there is some community pushback, and that is why I wanted to acknowledge and thank those six members that did the right thing. Also, as we go into the new fiscal year, um, I would really like to cons for the council to consider adding a possibly a youth public forum to encourage our youth to come and speak. Uh, this will give them an opportunity to participate and come and speak on the issues that they are interested in. Um, for the past three times that I've been speaking, I've been battling my daughter Bella, who is 10. Um, she's been wanting to come and speak as well. She has some things she wants to ask for the youth in the community, but her mother has other things that we're using these three-minute times. So I just think that would be a really nice way of encouraging our youth, um, maybe making it 25 and under so that they have, even if it's once a quarter, so that they have an opportunity that they know that they're welcomed and it's not tied in with heavier topics that we typically discuss. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next. Thank you, Ms. Malloy. Mm -hmm. Our final speaker for public forum is Ms. Lizette Rodriguez. Welcome, Ms. Rodriguez. Please state your name and where you reside, please. Lizette Rodriguez, 1701 Cherokee Drive. Um, firstly, I want to say it's so awesome to see all the arts folks in the back. It is really great to see you guys supporting the arts. Um, I'm a musician myself, so it is really cool to see Fayetteville come out, um, and I hope they get the funding that they asked for. Um, <laughs> but uh, for the matters that I am here today to speak on, I'm going to keep it a little brief because I thought I was not going to be able to speak uh, due to time constraints. But um, echoing Angela, I wanted to thank you all who voted um, against providing legal funds for the officers who killed Jada Johnson. Um, I know her family is probably very eternally grateful to all of you who did vote against that. And I also wanted to... Um, as you guys continue to potentially debate about um, the Office of Community Safety um, and potential future um, legal funds for the police department, I would like to ask you all to keep in mind um, something that Angela mentioned in her s remarks was that the Fayetteville Police Foundation um, decided to come out against the council and one thing I want us all to keep in mind is, um, again, echo echoing Angela, she kind of took the words out of my mouth, but to keep in mind that the reason police officers are not held accountable in this state and across the country is because of qualified immunity. And until we get rid of that, um, officers are gonna continue to not be criminally charged. So again, thank you council members who decided to wait until the evidence came out um, to, not vote in favor for this. And I'd also like to ask council um, if the council would be willing to um, maybe mention this to our police chief, but I know the public, we would all be very appreciative 
um, of having the body cam footage released to the public because we have been here for months asking for accountability and until we see that footage, until you all see that footage, nobody can truly be held accountable. But that video is under lock and key. Um, and I know Police Chief Braden made a request so that the council can see the video. Um, and I would like him to do the same for the people because we pay everybody's salaries here. Um, and that's all, thank you. Thank you, and that should close the public forum. Any more speakers? Yes, sir, we have no further speakers for the forum. Okay, very good. No, ma'am. Uh, going now into public hearings, and we're going to hold hearings where the city council formally seeks your input. Individuals desiring to speak in the hearing must have signed up to speak with the city clerk by name and address before this meeting begins. We begin with a staff presentation, and then we will move into the formal hearing. 15 minutes will be allowed for those in favor and for those opposed to the item of the hearing. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each, unless by a previous arrangement where a single spokesperson is designated, in which case the spokesperson may use the entire 15 minutes. When the city clerk calls your name, please come to the podium, clearly state your name and address for the record, you may then address the city council. When the light changes from green to amber, you have 30 seconds remaining. The timer will ring at the end of your allotted time. Now we will move to the staff presentation. Assistant City Manager Jeff Yates. Jeff, Mr. Yates. Yes, sir. There we go. All right, um, tonight we have our public hearing, as you mentioned. And we are in, uh, about two thirds of the way, three quarters of the way through our budget process. We held meetings in April, um, work sessions on April 18th, 28th, with small, count, uh, small group council briefings. May 1st, the 18th, June 1st, 5th, and 7th. So tonight is the public hearing. This is a legally required public hearing and it was properly advertised. And after this point, the council may adopt the budget at any time between here and the end of the fiscal year. We do have a uh, scheduled work session for Wednesday at noon, in which we'll talk about the capital funding plan and our debt portfolio. Um, we have an, a work session scheduled for the 21st at this point, and it is open for additional discussion. And then on the 26th, we um, intend to bring it back for adoption based on any guidance or changes that you as a council make. So I'll briefly just go through and kind of hit the highlights of what's in the proposed budget. It is available online for review by the residents. There's also a copy on file with the city clerk, and I believe there's also a copy at the library for those that would like to see it in paper. So the strategic focus of the budget, it focused on continuing operations and projects. What you have in front of you uh, for consideration is largely a budget that continues operations as they are at the city. Um, it's a focus on the, being the employer of choice, recruitment and retention. What we've included is a recommendation for 4% compensation increase for the general employees, a 1% increase to the 401k contribution. Right now the city contributes 1% while a lot of um, the municipalities, counties, and other organizations in the state contribute 5%. We, we are recommending 500,000 for continued market adjustments. Um, fund the police steps and the fire steps at one and a quarter of the step. And that actually changes uh, the percentage that they get, and we'll provide that information in a little more detail on uh, Wednesday. We also want to focus on serving the community. There is $250,000 in for a mental health coordinator. There is $250,000 for an annual commitment to Cape Fear Regional Theater. There is $300,000 for the operation of the City's Day Resource Center, which will be opening later this summer. Uh, focus on continuing fulfilling the Council's prior commitments. Continuing the investment in city's infrastructure through the CIP program. There's two million that the council had already committed to the MLK a park project, 3.3 million to the Reconstruction History Center, 450,000 to the Black Voices Museum. One big thing that is in this budget to help make it work with the loss of revenue is a $19.8 million efficiency estimate. In the past, we have included that estimate in the individual departments as a reduction to their personnel cost. This year, we have included it as a single line item so that we can see it, track it, and manage it as the year goes on. And 19.8 million is roughly about 15% of our personnel costs. 
We are experiencing, are expected to experience a $2 million reduction in the PwC pilot. That is really due to, due to the payback of the um, advance that PwC provided during the COVID. The, we anticipate they are holding back $2 million in 2023 and $2 million in 2024. Um, $500,000 annual increase in the ad valorem tax collection costs. As you remember in March, actually in April, your approved agreement with the county by which they collect our ad valorem taxes for us. And the cost of that collection has increased um, with that contract by about $500,000. Uh, the rates to needed, needed to maintain our services as they sit today, about 2.75 cents uh, for operations, and then a four and a quarter uh, in increase for the voter approved geo debt. And this starts the geo um, fund for the 2022 general obligation bonds. If you remember in the fall in November 2022, the public adopted our approved referendum for $97 million. And this is the start of that GEO program. It includes uh, public infrastructure at 25 million, 60 million for public uh, safety facilities, which is the 911 center and three fire stations. And then there is also funding in there about $12 million for housing and housing programs. We're, um, we're also recommending a $265 solid waste rate. That's an increase of a total of $40, or about $3.33 monthly um, for residential solid waste pickup. No increase in the stormwater rate at this time. And at this point, there is not a recommended increase in the transit fare, uh, but we will be resuming collections on July 1st. Um, all fund expenditures, and these are just the funds across the city, the total budgets, about 311.8 million. As you can see, the general fund is up, and that is largely driven by the increase in payments based on the new sales tax agreement. About $7.8 million increase in the payment or rebate we have to give to the county, and that is due to the change in the ad from, ad from the per capita tax collection to the ad valorem methodology and the contract or the agreement that the city entered into this spring. And what that means is that the city is capped at its 22 FY22 actual collections, and that difference is rebated back to the county. And we are estimating that to be about $7.8 million this year. We're also seeing about a $1.3 million increase in our personnel cost. This is above the proposed rate increases and uh, collection, or the proposed compensation increases. We're seeing about eight point, um, almost $9 million increase in transfers to other funds, primarily driven by the transfer to transit. And that is because um, over the last few years, transits relied on FTA funding from, for, uh, for COVID and during um, ARPA and the, and the COVID emergency. And that funding now has gone away and been reduced. So the city's having to pick, back that, pick up that funding going forward. Uh, so that's, those are the key points. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, one of the things I did want to point out is as, we, as we've talked a lot about the sales tax change, it's an opportunity for the city to kind of reassess its fundamental service package. So during the next year, we will be embarking, in fact, as soon as the calendar or the fiscal year flips in July, we'll start on next year's budget and go through a process of a full, full top-down review of the services provided and a strategic approach to trying to balance the budget into the future. What we have in front of you tonight and in this budget is not a long-term solution due to the loss of revenue and the, and the approach and the service package. So as we go forward into the next couple of years, as we've seen, we're gonna have to deal with that revenue loss and make service decisions. And you as a council will chart that strategic vision for the city going forward. Um, on the positive, we anticipate, um, we're working on about $69 million worth of federal grants, continue the implementation of the employer of choice because as we go through this strategic process, we're going to have to rely on our employees to be able to make it work and to be able to continue services. We want to explore different race structures in our stormwater utility, and then we want to continue to work on our robust work plans from across the city. So for tonight, the next steps, um, as we mentioned, the, public, the hearing was noticed in the observer on June 4th and 11th. Tonight, you'll receive comments concerning the budget and the manager's recommended budget. After the hearing, 
the council may adopt at any point. Um, and uh, as I laid out the calendar um, a little bit earlier. So with that, um, Mayor Pro Tem, I'll give you back the rest of the time and we can proceed to the public hearing unless there's any questions for me. Very good. Questions for Assistant City Manager Yates. Uh, Council Member Hare. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Just want to make our, those that are gonna be speaking at our public hearing tonight is that this is uh, really a presentation just for our public. The council, we are still looking at items and changes that will probably take place so I don't see us adopting uh, uh, tonight because I personally still have some concerns we spoke about and I won't go into all of them tonight. I'll just wait till our meeting on Wednesday. But this is mainly for the public to speak on. Thanks, Thank you, Councilmember Hare. Councilmember Ingram. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I have a statement, but I did have a question based off of what I heard in the public forum. Um, Madam Attorney, um, for the, and I don't know the, you know, the legal options available to this, but can you give some insight to our audience as it relates to, I think, the request that we submitted for the body camera footage to the judge and where we are with that? I don't know if that we can, I don't know the legal options for that. We did. Is that, okay. Well, that's well, probably an item that's out of order. Can you um, respond to her offline, City Attorney McDonald? Be well, happy please to. be happy to thank you Th well mr uh councilmember ingram thank you and i believe my item was out of order because i tried to catch it but i was denied but i'll move forward with my statement um so this evening uh we have been presented with a significant opportunity to provide support to the k for regional theater um through an annual allocation of two hundred fifty thousand dollars um the original request uh, from Cape for Original Theater was at 500,000 for the next five years. Um, this allocation aims to sustain and enhance artistic development opportunities for our youth and young adults in Fayetteville. I would like to take this moment to reflect on the significance of this request. First, it is essential to understand and acknowledge that not all of our children possess the means to participate in sports activities. By this support, we offer our alternative avenues for artistry and self-expression and personal growth. Additionally, we must recognize the achievements of notable individuals from our community, such as Dion Relaford, Alex Newell, Natasha Yvette Williams, Jay Harrison Gee, who have launched their careers at Cape Fear Regional Theater. Notably, as I announced earlier, one of those individuals received the Tony Award this weekend. And this is a testament to the caliber and of talent nurtured within this institution. Lastly, I would like to highlight an important aspect to me, that at the 11th hour, we asked Cape Fear Regional Theater to collaborate with the city of Fayetteville and go to Denver to create a presentation that would contribute to our attainment of the All-American City title. And I must emphasize that Cape Fear Regional Theater diligently submitted their request to the city seven months ago. And however, it appears that this request may not have been received with the same level of attention as other alloca allocations such as Martin Luther King Park and the Civil War Reconstruction Center, which were pr promptly addressed by the city and council. Lastly, I ask, let us not overlook the opportunity to continue to positively impact the lives of our children, like Miss Cece, and young adults in a significant manner. As de demonstrated tonight, with the support, we can enable them to thrive and bring honor to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Thank you, Thank you. Council Member Ingram. All right, any questions for <laughs> Assistant City Manager Yates? Seeing none, I open the required hearing. Madam Clerk, please call the first speaker. Yes, sir. We have 12 speakers signed up for the hearing. Our first speaker is Miss Ella Wren. Thank you. 
Hello, Ms. Wren. If you would state your name and where you reside, please. Certainly. My name is Ella Wren. I'm at 123 Judd Street. My name is Ella, and I'm the Managing Director at the Cape Fear Regional Theater. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight, and I know you have a lot of hard decisions ahead of you as you consider the budget. We want to start by saying that we are grateful for the partial support you have already granted us in the Capital Improvement Plan and are here to advocate tonight for CFRT's Phase 2 expansion project to be funded at the full $2.5 million request payable in increments of $500,000 over five years. I have some friends here with me tonight who represent the 50,000 people that CFRT impacts each year. In the theater, people who make everything happen behind the scenes wear black as their uniforms. And we have chosen this color today because while Mary-Kate and I are the face of this project, it is truly of, by, and for the community in full. Mary Kay and I came to Fayetteville six and five years ago, respectively, both from New York City and careers in professional for-profit theater. As a freelance administrator, I managed off-Broadway shows and the U.S. leg of an international YouTube tour. Mary Kate has served as the director of programming for the New York Musical Festival, as a vital part of the team at Dee Dee Harris Productions, a 10-time Tony Award-winning production office behind shows like Dear Evan Hansen, Hades Town, and Hairspray. We both came to Fayetteville because we believe that the role regional theaters play in creating communities is vital. And we believe that theater in service of a specific community creates art that is deeply meaningful, reflective of the people, and essential to our shared humanity. We believe that arts are for all. We first submitted our request to the city for funding on January 31st of this year, but we started working on this campaign in early 2020. In that time, we have completed and fully paid for a $1 million phase one renovation and raised $10.5 million toward the phase two expansion through quiet fundraising. The renovated building will be a jewel for our community. It will take our cloistered former movie theater and make it into a transparent, beautiful hub for the arts. We have grown 15% and now serve 50,000 people annually, the same as organizations with two and three times our operating budget. The phase two project will generate $47 million in direct and induced spending and contribute toward creating a vibrant place for economic recruitment and retention. With your $2.5 million commitment now, CFRT will reach its full potential as a world-class theater, ensuring that world-class art won't be a world away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Wren. Madam our, Clark. Next, our next speaker is Mr. Willie Wright. Colonel, sir, please state your name, where you reside. <laughs> Willie Wright, and I live at 196 Dyrock Court, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Very good. I would like to start by saying I spent 30 years in the military and retired in 1989. And then I went into Cumberland County School System and spent 26 years, retired in 2016. But my pride is the fact that I have spent 32 years with the Cape Fear Regional Theater. Wow. <laughs> Why? Because the Cape Fear Regional Theater is a jewel of Fayetteville for three reasons. It's committed to providing first-class entertainment to surrounding areas. And when I say surrounding areas, I'm talking about Lillington, Rayfoot, Pinehurst, Southern Pines, Wilmington, and we have buses coming from Raleigh, which provide revenue for our city. Cape Fear Regional Theater is growing in March of 2023, Matilda had an attendance of 9,000 in our theater. Education, there was a young fellow 
who in 2022 was invited by one of his friends to take a class at the Cape Fear Regional Theater. The young man didn't have enough funds to pay for it. Being a member of the church, we provided the money. But this young man was so joyous and impressed with what he was doing and what he learned at the theater that he saved his weekly allowance to pay his fee to attend the camp this summer. And if you go on Saturday the 17th, you will see him on stage. Cape Fear is proud to be a Blue Star Theater that supports and reaches out into our military community. We offer military discounts to every single event, military appreciation nights, which offer a steeper discount to each and every main stage show because we believe the arts are for all. Five years ago, Cape Fear Regional Theater launched Passport, a program for military children. Over eight weeks, passports provide an opportunity for creativity, self-expression, and social development. Originally subsidized by the North Carolina Arts Council, Passport is now self-sustaining through a partnership with the Reset and Rick's Place. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Mr. Zach Pritchett. Welcome, Mr. Pritchett. Please, please state your name. I'm Zach Pritchett, and I reside at 2722 Mirror Lake Drive. Um, I'm honored to serve as the board chairman for Cape Regional Theater this year. I also serve as a member of the steering committee for the multi-phase renovation project that we are undertaking as a gift to everyone in this community. As a young child, I can remember being mesmerized by the flashing lights of the CFRT marquee. The excitement I experienced when I finally saw my very first live performance at CFRT has rarely been matched as I have joined the audience for live theater at venues across this country. You see, my connection to the arts was manifested at CFRT because I don't have the abilities required uh, to perform on stage. Um, <laughs> at least not if we intend to sell any tickets, that is. Uh, so my contribution to the arts comes from giving up my time and my resources to support the great work being done at Cape for Regional Theater. And tonight, my duty called me here. While CFRT might not be in your district, it certainly impacts your constituents. In the audience, you will see people holding up signs of how many students we impacted in each of the city council districts. Our reach is wide and our impact is deep. The phase two renovation will be a crowning achievement for Fayetteville, for Cumberland County, and even I think for North Carolina. Cities like Chicago, DC, Dallas, and Denver have capped his eyes on the presence of thriving professional regional theaters within their communities. Regional theaters that are relationship oriented in service to the community and also bring the highest code, uh, highest caliber of work at an accessible price to their residents. CFRT already reaches audience in, in every zip code in North Carolina and in more than 30 states. Imagine how this will be enhanced by a beautiful state-of-the-art facility that emphasizes the customer experience from funding from finding a parking place through leaving after the show. Within 400 feet of our front door, this expansion project will transform CFRT's facilities and create more than 80 additional parking places in Haymount. Because CFRT believes in supporting our neighboring businesses, this additional parking will be in service for the rapidly developing Haymount community. We are also working with the NCDOT to install a crosswalk. Fayetteville, CS, CFRT has been doing Fayetteville's work for over 60 years and have not asked for funding in two decades. Your full investment at $2.5 million level will empower this project to break ground in 2024. 
Thank you, Mr. Pritchett. Well said. Goodness gracious. Our next speaker is Miss Mary Kate Burke. Welcome, Ms. Burke. Please state your name and where you reside. Well, hello. My name is Mary Kate Burke. I live at 2348 Rolling Hill Road. You are leaders in this community, and you are always thinking ahead, and I saw it throughout my entire time with you in Denver, the way you're ahead of the game, working with the youth, and investing in our future. The citizens and voters need you to lead now and back this project because it is at a critical juncture. So you hold the fate of this widely supported project in your hands. When we hit $15 million, we can break ground. We are currently at $10.5 million. The staff and the board and the steering committee are confident that we can raise the $2 million between now and this time next year. We have the first pass of bids back from a cost estimator, and we can actually build the building that we designed for just about $20 million. We have a three-year plan that will enable us to continue producing and teaching our classes while the building is under construction and with your support at 2.5 million dollars we will break ground at this time next year um, en route to opening this incredible facility in the fall of 2025 but without the fully funded requesting for this project it will be delayed now we're a pretty awesome team as some of you now know I can do a jump split on command but we will be hard-pressed to raise the 70% shortfall between our request and what is currently funded in the budget as you know construction rates increase with every passing day and if we are delayed this project will become more expensive also um, as the elected officials for this project's home other grant making organizations and other governmental bodies will take their cues for their level of support from you the state has come in and we need you to invest at a level that is reflective of the incredible work we are doing additionally we're gonna if we're gonna talk about what the best use of public funds is this will impact an incredible number of people off the jump. So from the year we open, we're going to impact 50,000 people. We aren't jumping the line. We've been on the line for 63 years. And investing in this project will make the line shorter for other projects because we're going to increase the real estate value in our area. We generate sales tax on every ticket we sell. And when we complete our new building, our budget's going to grow. And with more growth is more sales tax for the city to continue to do the good work of our community. CFRT is an integral part of the solution to the challenges you face. Now, in Denver, Assistant Manager Lindsay said, um, when we were in a circle, he said, we accomplished something together I didn't think we could do. That is the work we do at CFRT every day, those feelings that we felt together, working to tell a story, bringing different people together to join and listen and collaborate and be brave and be witnessed. That is the work we do every day at the theater, which is why we enjoy the support of all of these people in the room. We only emailed them six days ago, and here they are. So I encourage you to support this project at the amount requested. You will make a huge difference. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Ms. Amber Whitaker. Ms. Whitaker, if you'll state your name and uh, where you reside, please. I am Amber Whitaker, 838 Whispering Pines Road, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Thank you. Good evening. I am Amber Whitaker, a graduate of E. Smith High School. I wanted to share some experience from that I have from CFRT. They have been amazing since entering those doors three years ago. My daughter started from a young age, interested in acting, writing plays, and having me watch them after it was complete. She will always use her stuffed animals, and I thought, wow, my baby girl is very talented. You see, my family is a sports family. We don't have much talent when it comes to the art, besides her uncle Aaron. I asked my brother first, did he know of anything? And then I asked on social media, does anyone know where I can get Melody into some acting classes? There it was, the Cape Fear Regional Theater. I immediately reached out and I was able to get her into summer camp, the Fantastic Finn. I just want y'all to know that, hold on, I'm sorry. I just want you guys to know um, that Melody found her passion that summer. We had a break. We had a break with COVID, but she came right back after. 
I am so thankful for the Kafer Regional Theater because my daughter has fallen in love with theater. And she has met lifelong friends that have now have crossed paths that never may have crossed paths before. They even have a group chat, 19 deep. <laughs> Kafer Regional Theater also has provided scholarships for my daughter to continue to pursue passion and let's not for her passion and let's not forget she was in Matilda. <laughs> I'm forever thankful for what they have done for my daughter and I. I mean, let's be honest, they have directly helped so many others. I am a special education teacher at E. Smith High School as well now, and we have continued to go to these plays year in and year out. We also, we always go to um, the best Christmas pageant ever, and the one that my daughter went to that she, that made her want to join is Shrek, where Mark was <laughs> the donkey. <laughs> I'm so thankful for those that support the arts, but please, please help those that look like us in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whitaker. Mr. Marcus Sultran. Mr. Soltran, if you'll state your name and where you reside, please. Uh, good evening, members of the council. My name is Marco Soltran. I reside at 2808 Sky Drive. I'm here to uh, implore that you fully fund the Cape Fear Regional Theater for their full funding that they've requested. Um, I've been a resident of Fayetteville here for the last 28 years. Um, my wife and I and my four children have raised them here. And we discovered the jewel of Cape Field Regional Theater early on. We've been to many performances, and I can assure you the quality there is, is just as high as anywhere else you'll see. We've seen shows in Raleigh, Durham, and even New York, and, and I'll put them up against any one of those. Um, we've enjoyed it, it over the years, but truly felt the impact it has in our community when our children started watching shows and then, more importantly, started participating. Two of them were inspired to join the, the summer camps and very quickly went on to participating on stage and are now performing in lead roles. And I've seen their confidence grow and I'm very proud of what they've done. And not only for themselves, but also inspiring other children as well. The students that come to see the shows during the daytime matinees probably won't get an opportunity to see a theater anywhere else. Uh, it's a great outreach that the theater does for the community and can definitely bring us all together. Talent is talent. It, it, talent doesn't know color, doesn't know background, uh, financial status. On stage, everyone is equal. They're, they continue to uh, join with each other, and uh, delaying the funding will only delay our community from uh, combining even more. So I implore you to, to fully fund that and help not only encourage the, the community, but also the facility that we're going to have downtown, which will encourage all the financial development that they spoke of earlier. Thank you. Miss Angela Malloy. Miss Malloy, welcome back. <laughs> so it wasn't planned for me to have, oh, Angela Malloy. Um, 131 Hay Street. Thank you. Um, it wasn't planned for me to wear this, but I match the art, so I'm going to take some of my time to um, piggyback on them. Uh, I've been a resident in um, not only Fayetteville, but in the Haymount area for 53 years. Um, I love utilizing the um, Cape for Regional Theater. I have seven, soon to be eight grandchildren, plus Bella, who is 10. We enjoy that is something to look forward to is coming to plays when they come visit Nani in the winter for their winter break in the summertime. Um, so and also being a part of a nonprofit that, you know, a lot of you may and those listening may hear, well, they have all this money. I'm a nonprofit where we raise 10 million. But when the project that you're doing costs 17 million, you still need more money. So I hope that as people are hearing the amount that they're asking for, it's a huge um, feat that they were able to get five million, they matched it by raising five million. So I really do hope and implore that you provide them with the amount that they're asking for so that um, I need to entertain those grandkids. I need y'all to have this stuff. Um, also, I wanna give some um, thank yous out again for um, including Mama's Village in the um, funding. 
This is going to allow, uh, again, Fayetteville, we've heard about a lot of firsts that they've had. This is the first city in the entire state of North Carolina that has done this, and others um, are looking to model this. You're going to increase the city with um, birth workers, community-based doulas, lactation consultants um, that can work in the community and our hospital as well, along with lactation counselors. So I look forward to reporting back with you. I know you'll love to hear from me every month about our progress that we're making in um, the workforce development and um, maternal health. Now this leads me to the next issue, and I'm going to talk fast because my time is passing, um, is you know rec the community response. We um, have seen that the tragic events that happen with our officers and mental health calls keep happening. And um, again, what I want to start off with is thanking the council and city manager in attempting to meet the request that we've been asking as far as an OCS. Um, even though there was an addition instead of Office of Community Safety, it's Office of Community Safety and Mental Health. Um, and we'll talk about that in the future as far as like, you know, how that can impact. But I want to thank with the attempt of, you know, having a uh, mental health navigator. I'm a little confused by, um, I know we have the system to city manager. I didn't see that listed. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll have that defined more. But I'm looking forward to having those roles um, supported find better and also I went through all 340 pages of that budget if we can get a, um, a reader friendly version of that um, we know that it's available for the public um, I've been through some budgets I have to present you know provide budgets but we need to have a better version if we want our citizens to know how the city is spending the money thank, thank you, you very much Ms. Malloy Ms. Lizette Rodriguez. Welcome again, Ms. Rodriguez. State your name and where you reside, please. Hello, Lizette Rodriguez, 1701 Cherokee Drive. Hi, Council. Um, I'm here to give feedback uh, on the proposed city budget. In its current form, um, $250,000 has been ab allocated to hire a mental health navigator or maybe coordinator, because what was on the screen is a little different. Um, so I'd like to thank the council and city manager Hewitt for this first step forward in changing the way the city of Fayetteville responds to public safety matters. While this first step is a win, I have concerns about how the city seems to be piecing together an office of community safety without the prior foundation in place. So today I'm asking you to take a tiny step a baby step sideways and to help lay the foundation of the house before you buy art for its walls. I believe there's enough funding allocated for that mental health pos position to also hire a director of an office of community safety while still staying, staying in budget. Before Durham implemented their very successful Durham Heart pilot program, the city manager first established an office of community safety with a director. The same goes for Greensboro, and the same goes for the Office of Neighborhood Safety in Richmond, California. As a testament to their success, Richmond has had the highest homicide rate in California, but 10 years later, after their city implemented their Office of Neighborhood Safety, there was an 80% reduction in the homicide rate. Their violence interrupter programming was associated with a 55% reduction in gun homicides and hospitalizations and a 43% reduction in fire-related crimes. Um, according, and that's according to an evaluation published in the American Journal of Public Health. By not hiring a director, the city is already deviating from the models that other cities have proven to work. All three of these positions, the mental health coordinator, um, the director, and the new assistant city manager can all coexist and work in harmony and collaborate with one another. My biggest concern with the senior assistant position is that according to the do job listing, the city prefers a sworn police officer, EMT, or fireman. The independent oversight portion of the OCS has been completely erased. This position could just be another form of the police policing the police. According to the National Association of Civilian Oversight for Law Enforcement, having independent oversight increases greater or ensures greater accountability, increases community confidence in police, and helps protect our civil rights. It also helps cities manage risks from lawsuits due to unlawful actions by individual officers or department failures. And the city is potentially on its way towards another lawsuit after a Fayetteville Police, Depa 
the police department officer with a history of mental illness killed his wife and himself. So this can-do city must do better, and it begins by saying yes to OCS. Thank you. Thank you. Miss LaSherry Droughton. Welcome, Ms. Drawhorn. Uh, if you'll state your name and where you reside, please. Thank you. I am LaSherry Drawhorn, and I live at 2109 Sapona Road. My beautiful daughter, Lana Drawhorn, was introduced to the, Fayette, the Cape Fear Regional Theater stage in the summer of 2021 through the 10 through 14 Summer Theater Camp Program. Every day she was so excited to be a part of the summer camp experience. School had just recently opened after being closed due to COVID and Lana was missing the social emotional learning experience due to the isolation. Cape Fear Regional Theater provided the community that she needed and she still needs now. It takes a village to raise a child and Cape Fear Regional Theater, theater has and had <clears throat> a major role in my child's personal and professional development. Lana's freshman year of high school, she was extended an invitation to audition for The Color Purple at the Cape Fear Regional Theater. This took her from the theater camp to the main stage. Now at this time, she so desperately needed an outlet to unplug from the stressors of life, and this opportunity provided that. She'd come home with excitement, talking about having the opportunity to work with Broadway director and choreographer Brian Harlan Brooks. He told her she was destined for greatness. This experience gave her so much confidence that has permeated in her world outside of theater, which is why she's not even here today. She is presently competing in the National Speech and Debate Competition in Arizona. <laughs> Lana has gained more confidence, which has made her an even better leader. She has also gained a community of diverse friends, making her even more empathetic. Being involved in the Cape Fear Regional Theater has directly impacted her road to self-discovery, leading to an improvement of her self-esteem. Just some facts about what Cape Fear Regional Theater has done so far. The education programs of Cape Fear Regional Theater have grown 45% in the past few years through on-site programs like student matinees, camps, classes, and in-school outreach like the teen touring program that takes adaptations of children's books into local elementary schools for less than $1 per student. I actually am an elementary school music teacher and we just had a teen production that kids at my school, a Title I school, would not normally get to experience the theater. And Cape Fear Regional Theater brought the theater to them. And we, we're grateful for that. Cape Fear Regional theater, theater knows and values how important young people are to our collective future and the betterment of our communities. As a tier one county, not every student has the financial capacity to attend the theater. So each year, Cape Fear Regional Theater directly subsidizes more than 250,000 in student tickets so that experiencing the arts can be attainable for all. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Rohan. Mr. John Malzone. Mr. Malzone, welcome to Fayetteville. <laughs> I think it's probably. Uh, Tell us your name and all the yes, I certainly property. Will. You don't have yes, to use sir, the Mr. one Mayor upon Pro Tem, hers. Members of the you council, can... my name is John Malzone. I sleep at 175 Midland Lane in Pinehurst. I live at 108 Hay Street. Um, I am here to also urge the council to fully fund the Cape Fear Regional Theater's request. I was very fortunate when I opened my real estate office in Fayetteville in 1978 that a guy named Herb Thorpe was my attorney. Through Herbert, I met his lovely bride, uh, Bo, nice Italian girl, and uh, she introduced me to the theater and what it was. And what I've done over the past 50 years that I've been in town 
55, actually. I have been selling Fayetteville. And I'm going to tell you, when I first started, and I would show people what there was to do in Fayetteville, trust me, in 1978, there wasn't much. But the Cape Fear Regional Theater turned their heads. And I'm still doing that tour, and the Cape Fear Regional Theater is still an asset that I show people. They're so accessible. They let me bring folks right in. People like Mike Nagowski, CEO of Cape Fear Valley Health Systems. Uh, how about the new director of the Botanical Garden? Uh, Ella, uh, when I took you around and showed you how great Fable would be, we didn't go to the theater. We started at the theater. <laughs> this is something that the theater, and I am not in black because I didn't work backstage when I was with the theater. I was either on the board for about 15 years, but I did about a half dozen shows until my business just prevented me from doing any more. So I was tripping the board, so to speak. Um, this theater is so phenomenal, and it is such a tremendous asset. And in the face of all kinds of problems, they have never shirked back. At a time when theaters, local, well-known, established theaters are closing all across our country, our theater is growing. Our theater sees the future. And I've got to, I'd be remiss before I leave to not congratulate you all and the All American City, having been the PR chairman the first time around back in 84. God bless you all. And Fable is a great place. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Malzone. Miss Melody Smith. Welcome, Ms. Smith. <laughs> if you'll state your name and where you reside, please. My name is Melody Smith, and I live at 2425 Castle Bar Drive. Very good. Um, I'm here to tell you that CFRT is an amazing theater, and it really helped me grow a lot. And I really respect that they helped me do all of this stuff that I never thought I could do at this theater. So I really wanted to sing us a song. Okay. Five hundred twenty-five thousand sixty-five minutes. Five hundred twenty-five thousand moments, oh dear. Five hundred twenty-five thousand six hundred minutes. How do you measure, measure? Thank you, young lady. And mom. Our final speaker for the uh, public hearing is Miss Bobby Burgess. Can't wait to see this next act. <laughs> Miss Bobby Burgess. And she was here earlier. Yeah, I think she's in the in the Lafayette conference room. Okay, there she is. <laughs> Welcome, Miss Burgess. Please state your name and where you reside, please. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Bobby Burgess, and I reside at twenty one zero eight Constitution Drive. 
I will say that me wearing black today was completely coincidental, um, <laughs> but my support of the theater is totally intentional, and I started volunteering with them at the top of this calendar year, and it's quickly become another family for me here in Fayetteville, so please give them their money. That's all I'll say on that. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna tell a story of someone who I'm really, really close to, but do keep in mind that this story represents just like a moment in time, a snapshot of time, and does not necessarily represent a consistent or overall like state of mind. So, May 20th, 2022, there was a woman living on her own in, in an apartment, and she was struggling with some severe end of life thoughts. And she was presented with three options. One, stay at home and risk her own safety, being by herself. Two, call 911 or the police, to uh, escort her to potentially the hospital, or three, admit herself to Cape Fear Valley Hospital and hope that the co-pays weren't gonna be too much and that the insurance would cover it, the majority of it. The woman I'm speaking about is me. It's me. I was faced with those choices. I remember being on the phone with my mom that day and I said, I don't wanna call 911. I don't wanna get shot. Real thought. One, I knew I wasn't safe enough. I knew I couldn't stay home, so I, I went with option three, and luckily, I know this is a privilege. My insurance covered enough of it that I was not bankrupt trying to go and spend that time there. And OCS, an Office of Community Safety, did not exist then. But luckily, I still do. And for me, an OCS is not only essential for saving lives from police brutality, but it's also essential for saving lives for suicide prevention. So that's why I'm up here today to make sure that an OCS is set up correctly. And I very much appreciate the council and what they've done so far in the budget to try to make space for an office community safety. But right now it's just not there yet. There needs to be some more structure. An assistant to the city manager public safety is not a director of OCS, just very promptly put. Not, not call credentialed, there's no specific call out for an OCS in the job description, and the sworn law officer pr preference is concerning. So for it to be effective, we need someone that understands the roles and the structures of an OCS. And to do that, we need a job description that's specific to that role. And we have enough money to do it, and cities like Durham and Greensboro have already done it. But let me make it clear, any other arrangement for OCS that doesn't have a specific director will not work. Thank and you, if it Ms. doesn't Burgess. work, I will say quite literally that people like me cannot afford for it not to work. Okay? All right. So Thank you. So, as director of OCS now. Thank you, Mayor. I'm done now. Councilmember Ingram, did you have your hand up? You're still in the public hearing. Is yeah, in... close it. All right. So, this, the comment has nothing to do with the public hearing? I think we have to close the public hearing to have comments. Does your comment have anything to yes, do with the public does. hearing? Then if continue, the public hearing will stay open. Give us your comment. No, we have to close the... We, we have no further speakers, right. sir. The like public the hearing is process. now closed. All right, we'll move towards Mr. the uh, agenda. I? No, no, ma'am. Well, we the agenda 9.02. The contract award for the downtown no. district management. Point of order. We had to close the public hearing for me to have comment. I had. I closed the public and hearing. And now it's you, my time to speak. No, Thank you. No, you're out of order. I'm not out of order, uh, sir. City manager, would you call your staff member up to present the contract Absolutely award? Absolutely not. We, no, we're not going to do this. I'm not out of order. Thank you. Madam Attorney, is this allowed in a, a point of order? She's... It Typically, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, you would close the public hearing, and then if council has any comments or questions, receive those. All right. Go ahead, Council Member Ingram. Thank you. So. Um, I, ju I just would like to say to the council this evening, um, to the mayor in his absence, Mayor Pro Tem and council, my colleagues, as you've seen here tonight, the Cape Fear Regional Theater um, is impacting and changing lives 
Um, additionally, right in front of your eyes tonight, you've seen that they've fostered a level of community that I know that we wish we would all see more of in this city. Um, while we may not vote on the budget tonight, I ask that when you go home, you think about what you've heard, seen, and felt with recognition of each and every one of our districts being impacted by what they do. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ingram. Are there any more? Do any other council members have any comments that would like to make? Seeing none. Uh, council member Benavente, you have a comment? Yes, sir. Well, you know, I think that I made an effort. I know that all the council members here have made an effort to let folks know this is the time to make your voice heard. If you want to speak on the city's finances, the city's budget, this was the public hearing to make sure that you had your voice heard. Um, in addition to CFRT, I think it was made loud and clear that the citizens of Fayetteville expect an Office of Community Safety to be established here in the city of Fayetteville. Uh, there are no other groups here besides CFRT and OCS. Um, I think that deserves the weight uh, of what a public hearing is meant to have. And for us to ignore either CFRT or the Office of Community Safety Advocates would be a huge mistake. Thank you, Council Member Benavente. Any other comments from members of council? Seeing none, we'll move forward to 9.02. City Manager. Presented by Chris Cawley. Welcome, Mr. Cawley. Evening, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council. Uh, Chris Cawley, Director of Economic Community Development. And tonight we have a required public hearing on the contract consideration for our municipal service district. So that is our downtown management company. So we've had a district here in the city since 1978. Um, what that does is it levies an additional tax rate on property owners downtown. That is currently 10 cent per $100 in valuation. And that produces about $140,000 annually. Um, costs that that helps to pay for include utilities and debt service for the Franklin Street parking deck and the downtown management contract. That's not enough money, so the general fund also subsidizes the downtown contract with about $100,000 a year um, to help promote that arts and entertainment district in downtown. So some state law changes happened back in 2016 that kind of prescribed how this all goes with downtown management. And so it lets the city enter into an agreement with a private organization to provide downtown management services, but it requires that we gather input from the property owners um, a formal bid process and that we have a public hearing before we enter into that contract. So Cool Spring Downtown District has been the managing partner for the downtown since 2017 and they've had tremendous success in place-based economic development in our downtown. They host various downtown events, manage logistics in the district, and work with property owners, businesses, and residents to proactively resolve issues uh, that may arise. When we put out the request for proposals, Cool Spring Downtown District was the only respondent to that request. And the response includes a change of terms from prior years and two options that we're gonna go over. So option, uh, they came with an A and a B proposal from Cool Springs. Option A was a $220,000 contract with an annual inflation adjustment that they have calculated at an average of 6% a year per year. So because staff is recommending a five-year term to the contract to coincide with the five-year um, uh, rate that you just put in place at, in, in consent earlier, uh, that would mean that the fifth year of this contract would be $294,680. If you recall, when we looked at the available revenues that we produce here, it's about $140,000 for the tax rate and then another hundred that goes in from the general fund. So as we go through the next couple of slides and we talk about that, keep that in mind because that means that the differential would either have to come from an, an increase in property tax rate in the MSD or from an increase in general fund subsidy. Option B from Cool Springs uh, is a little more complex, so I'll go through it slowly. Um, it is uh, $220,000 with an annual inflation rate adjustment of 6% per year, just like option A. 
It also asked to fund the ambassador program that was a one-time appropriation from city council last year at $50,000 annually and to fund New Year's Eve, Juneteenth and July 4th at $380,000. Uh, that both of those, the 50 and the 380, would come with that 6% annual inflation as well. So that's a lot more cost on there, um, but with that, with that five-year term, that would end up being a, a fifth-year cost of $837,000, 500 and, and change. Um, the prior contracts that we've had since 2017 have been funded at $220,000 per year, um, and that has been flat. So our team took a look at this. We talked to finance, talked to the budget department, and tried to figure out what all that meant when we got that proposal back. So both of these options um, increase the impact to the general fund because, as we just stated, the MSD's revenues do not cover the full cost of the contract, so the general fund would need to cover that, or conversely, the tax rate for the MSD would need to go up. We looked at the property tax growth in the district and averaged the revenue produced by that tax rate over the past five years. And it, it's up and down some years, but it's averaged out at about 3% every year. The ambassador program, as I mentioned, was a, a one-time uh, fund balance appropriation. So that was money that we had in the rainy day fund in the MSD that we pulled out and spent one time. So we can't continue to pull that out and spend it because we spent it the one time. So the only options there would be to increase the MSD rate or to fund that out of the general fund as well. The special events that council has been doing over the past couple of years and Cool Springs has been incredibly successful at putting on and managing, um, they're included in the Parks and Recreation Department's 24 budget. Um, they're currently budgeted in the budget you're presented by the city manager at $276,000. However, Cool Springs is requesting $380,000 to provide those events. So we're going to kind of walk through this and, and, and help you all navigate it because we're, we, we've got some decisions to make on this. So we came up with four options as a staff. Um, option one was not one of the proposals from Cool Springs. It was to fund the $220,000 contract at a five-year term and tag that to the property tax rate, uh, the pop property tax growth over time, which is 3%. Option two would be to approve it at $220,000 for a five-year term and tie that to the estimated inflation, which is currently estimated at about 6%. Option three would be to add all of those additional things into this five-year contract, which would be the $220,000, the $50,000, and the three special events at three hundred eighty, dollars for, and then all of that would also be adjusted by inflation at 6%. And then four is uh, to not approve the contract um, we, that's not going to be a recommendation from staff, but you could send us back to, back to the drawing board to figure out a, a new solution. So out of that, staff has a recommendation. Um, so first, holding the required public hearing that we have to do after this presentation. And then upon closing that public hearing, we recommend that City Council move to approve the contract for, to the Cool Spring Downtown District for enhanced services for a five-year term at $220,000 adjusted by the estimated property tax growth, which was that 3% number. So, um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, at your pleasure, I can take questions. We can open a public hearing and then do that. Um, yes, sir. All right. Um, City Manager, you want us to open the public hearing and then get questions from council? Or, because I've got folks with their hands up now. Um, I would probably say um, uh, it's, it's your choice, but typically we, um, if there are just some questions about the presentation that um, he gave, um, okay. then that might work, or it may be better to hear from the public, but it's okay. your choice, sir. I'll go ahead, uh, Council Member Hare. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. The, the recommendations, could you go back one slide? Uh, number one, is that that property tax growth and that 3% is, are we only speaking for the downtown district? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Any other questions from the council before we open the public hearing? All right. Seeing none. I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem. Let me, let me answer an unasked question here. Oh. So um, <laughs> with staff's recommendation, we do not speak to the annual events that city council has been asking Cool Springs to do. And so I want to kind of broach that. Um, what we're recommending is that Parks and Rec come back after the budget is adopted 
for a contract for services that includes those events within the budget that you have available. So we're not throwing that off the table. We're including that, but that would be an item for Parks and Recs to bring back and, and you know, help council navigate. So staff is recommending option number one? Yes, sir. Okay. So council, everybody? Yes, good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cawley. Uh, question, council member Hare. And go back again, Chris. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, that last portion that you were speaking of that would be coming to us from, uh, I, I guess you said Parks and Rec. Yes, sir. Is that, are you speaking of special events? Yes, sir. Those, uh, the New Year's Eve, Juneteenth, and okay. July 4th okay. would come back after the budget is adopted as a contract for okay. services. For, for additional requests. Of yes, sir. Finance. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. We are opening the required hearing. Madam Clerk, please call your first speaker. We just have one speaker for this item, Mr. John Malzone. Ah, Mr. Malzone. Thank you. Tell us your name and... Yes, uh, John Malzone, 175 Midland Lane, Pinehurst, 108 Hay Street in Fayetteville. As the uh, treasurer of Cool Spring Downtown District, I just want you to imagine yourselves opening a business in 2017 with X amount of dollars and operating that same business in 2024 with that same budget. Inflation at 3%, I don't know where we're getting inflation at 3%. I mean, I'll tell you from a real estate value standpoint, the real estate values, and I can speak of that with a certain degree of expertise, having sold a bunch downtown, those values are going right through the roof. As a matter of fact, there's a lack of availability of spaces, and I'm getting inquiries from out of state. People are seeing what's going on downtown. They've caught wind of the $131 million Performing Arts Center on top of our $43 million Segra Stadium, on top of Southern Pines Brewery opening their key location they're going to have at least two or three million dollars in that they know things are happening and with all due respect you've got a staff of three people you've got bianca you've got lauren and you've got ashanti and no offense but you go and say hey let's do juneteenth boom uh hey let's do july 4th hey let's do new year's eve and these have turned out to be key events. I know a little bit about putting together those events. I know how complicated it is. And unfortunately, Cool Spring doesn't have the volunteer base that some other organizations do. We're growing the volunteer base. But I'm going to tell you that the 3% increase, it's illogical. It's absolutely illogical. The 6% is what we, an executive, decided would be fair. And we went in at 220 only because we were renegotiating the contract and we didn't want to jump it too crazy. But you are getting so much bang for your buck out of this organization. I was on the Arts Council board and I had the honor of making the motion to fund the Cool Spring Downtown District. And it was a result of a study that the Arts Council did years ago where we wanted to find out, could we support a performing arts center? And the consultant said, no, not unless you have a viable, there's nobody else, so I guess I can keep talking. <laughs> unless you have a viable arts and entertainment district. And that's why the Arts Council stepped forward and went ahead with that motion. But it has become now a part of city government. There's a lot of things that the Cool Spring folks are doing that would take staff members to do. That would be an interesting cost analysis to see how much money they are actually saving you because these things are not cheap to put on, especially when they have the success. So I would urge you to think very seriously about this. I was down on the Cool Spring District for the first two years. Well, I'm, well, let me get guidance from the city attorney okay. um, because he 
He well, was. I'm um, the only speaker. Well, oh, uh, okay. Was there a second speaker, another speaker? Yes. There is another speaker? Oh, we have two okay. more. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I thought uh, Sorry. you said only Thank one. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Malzone. Thank you for your consideration. Yes, sir. My May apologies. I... We have two more speakers. Oh, thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Bianca Schoenman. Welcome, Ms. Schoenman. Please state your name and where you reside, please. Hey, good evening. My name is Bianca Shoneman, 222 Hayes Street. What a pleasure to be here tonight. A couple months ago, I was back at City Council, and we were celebrating Native American Heritage Month, and that was a beautiful night at City Council. You guys remember that? And I just have to congratulate CFRT in creating another beautiful night for us here tonight. We're pleased to be here. You know, back in 2015, the city, the Arts Council, the county, and uh, the Downtown Alliance came together and did a feasibility study to look at creating a performing arts center in the downtown district. That feasibility study came back and said, in the absence of using arts and entertainment to fuel your city, that, that performing arts center will not survive. So in 2017, our entity was stood up as an organization centered on downtown management and also using arts and entertainment to create a thriving economic center, business, central business district. You know, since 2017, we've been around and we've celebrated some big wins. Some of those include uh, 34 additional new businesses downtown, nearly 900,000 gross square feet of new and adaptive reuse construction in our little five by five and a half 0.55 mile area. Uh, in 2018, we started programming the downtown and I'm pleased to say that we had just under 21,000 people come to our 22 events. Last year, when we closed out the fiscal year in 2022, we hosted 47 events and we brought over 77,000 people to the downtown district, just with our staff of three and our great volunteers that um, bring downtown together. You know, we've been steadily trying to grow our presence on a digital format, too, creating the Downtown Vibe hashtag. Um, some, some of the things we do that you guys might not know that we do is we manage trash. We have an active dumpster program that manages cardboard, recycling, and also trash management in the downtown. We're pulling out nearly 300,000 pounds of garbage a year in downtown Fayetteville to keep our streets clean. We also, entirely with public do uh, private dollars, purchased and managed a regular rotating trolley system that connects our residential nodes to our downtown district. And we also just recently lost, launched an ambassador program. And you saw a little slide about that earlier, about why the ambassador program should be. You didn't really get much on that, but the, the ambassador program is a big program that helps clean our streets. It supplements what the city already does. It works with our homeless population, those in mental health crisis. It also provides wayfinding. These are all really important elements to our downtown community. Thanks for having me tonight. Thank you, Ms. Schoenman. Bebro Town, our next speaker is Ms. Molly Arnold. Welcome, Ms. Arnold. If you'll state your name and where you either live or reside. Hi, I'm Molly Arnold. My home is at 1908 Queen Street. I do spend more time downtown than I do there, though, so, hey. So um, for the past three years, it has been my honor to serve as the Cool Spring Board Chair. But tonight I'm really speaking to you as the owner of two downtown buildings. So I have willingly for 25 years paid into the MSD as an extra tax. I have taken one building that had a value of $15,000 and increased it by 125% to increase that tax base and also the amount I pay. The Municipal Service District tax is for enhanced services. And I was happy to pay that extra tax so we could get light poles, sidewalks, all sorts of those things. And when I was ready to stop paying it, because hey, seemed to be done, we got Bianca Schoenemann. And I signed up one more time because that organization with that small, mighty staff does some good work. And I just wanted to mention that because enhanced services are not basic services. It's not supposed to be 
police presence. It's not really supposed to be any of those things that all the other residents get as part of their normal tax base. So I'm urging you to vote to award the municipal service contract to the Cool Spring Downtown District. They have proven themselves and they will continue to do the work for you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. We have no further speakers. All right, we'll close the public hearing. I noticed some hands were up. Uh, Council Member Hare, uh, your hand is up. Thank you, um, Mr. Director, or our city manager, whichever, uh, help me, give me, help me with clarity on this. All right, I remember when we started the MSD. I think it was, it started out at what, 10 cents, was it? It's been 10 cents for a yeah, long time. Well, okay, 10, 10 yeah. cents. Now, the request that we're hearing tonight to approve is that, is all of that going to fall within the MSD or is it also in addition for funding from the city. It, it, g give me clarity on that because I'm looking, I'm, I'm, I'm going back and forth with the 6% request to the 3% that looks palatable here. Uh, so out of the $220,000 contract, uh, essentially 120 of it comes from the MSD revenues and 100 comes from the general fund moving money over into that pot. Okay. 100 from the general fund. Now, when I did notice also in the docket that there is a piece in there, I think, of 3% every year for annual inflation. Where does that fall at? Is that MS? Is that the uh, MSD or is that uh, with the city? So, so what I did to arrive at the 3% is I looked at the revenues produced by the tax rate for the past five years, yes, and it was 2%, 2%, 5%, and 4%, and that averaged out to be 3% revenue growth each year. So that's not necessarily inflation. That's the growth in revenues that we receive from that $0.10 cent tax rate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, as we all know, in inflation has, has been high in, in the recent year. Thank you, I'm here for Tim. Thank you, Council Member Jensen. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So I'm going to ask some questions, and I think that everybody knows in this room that I'm a supporter of the theater. I'm a supporter of the downtown district. I'm a supporter of Cool Springs. They do a great job. I get it. We need it all. I want new Christmas decorations. I want it all. I go big. But we're at a problem right now. Inflation is up. We're in the budget. And we are having to really, you know, cross our T's and dot our I's. The question that I have is, I'm going to go back a little bit. When we first started in 2017, Cool Springs came to us and asked us for $100,000. Is that correct? Correct? So... My understanding is when they came to us, they had talked to the county, too. Have we ever gone back to the county and asked for any money? Um, I'm asking uh, my boss, uh, Assistant City Manager Kelly Oliveira, to come give me a little bit of a history lesson. So <laughs> the reason why I'm saying this, and I want people to understand, because I can, I can tell you most everybody up here wants to give the 6%. But if we give the 6%, it's coming off of something else. And that's where we are. And, and we have to be realistic about it. But the question that I want people to understand is, it is great that we have people coming downtown. It is great that we have a social district. But everybody doesn't understand, when people buy that drink, we get no 
tax money off of it. We get nothing to help us make you succeed. So I, I, I'm almost to a point that I want to go back to talk about this instead of tonight because if we do vote to do 6%, something else is going to have to come off. And we're talking about parking. We have the least expensive parking probably than anybody around. So it, 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 it's something we have to discuss as a um, council. So just my opinion. Thank you, Councilmember Jensen. Councilmember Ingram. Thank you. I'm prepared to make a motion. All right. Um, before we do that, Councilmember, is there anyone else that has any questions for staff before we go to a motion? Seeing none, Councilmember Ingram. Um, I'd like to move to approve the MSD ma management contract at $220,000 for five-year term, adjusted annually by the estimate property tax growth at 3%. All right. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Uh, second, Councilmember Hondros. Move to discussion. Looking for hands, seeing no hands. All right, ask for your vote. I believe that is unanimous by all those present. Thank you, Council. Next item, operations agreement. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Thank you, Ms. Oliveira. Thank you all. Item number 10.01, Operations Agreement for Parks and Rec Consolidation between City and Cumberland County. Mr. City Manager. This is Mr. Gibson. There he is. <laughs> Come forth. <laughs> uh, this will be presented by um, Fayetteville Cumberland Parks and Recreation Director Michael Gibson. Welcome, Mr. Gibson. Hey, how you doing? Thank you. I'm not sure what you would like to know. So if you, um, if you could start by talking about how we merged in 2004, I think that the council's primary interest has been around um, when have we modified the agreement, discussed the agreement since it was, it was first. But if you could start by talking about, I guess, very briefly for some who um, uh, may not have um, known okay. the history, why we joined in 2004. Okay, um, the, the, the contract agreement was dated uh, the seventh day of June 2004. Um, it was a consolidation agreement where the city of Fayetteville would then become Fayetteville Cumberland Parks and Recreation. Um, we would then be running the uh, recreational system um, of the county and all who were in the district in the unincorporated area, which included but not um, excluded Hope Mills and Spring Lake. Um, now we're here 19 years later, and we've included Spring Lake, and the program has grown. Um, the biggest thing in here for the agreement is based on um, like facilities, even though you're in, a, in an urban environment versus a rural environment, but all facilities would look the same. Um, I think we've done a good job over the last 17 to 19 years, um, and I think one of the uh, points is that there would be a cost of sixty thousand dollars of indirect costs um, that would go for the city's management um, from a, a municipality standpoint of that system um, all the employees that were in the county then became city employees um, there was a five cent on the hundred that would uh, be paid into the system by the county uh, to operate their system um, as of the date that number um, has done what it's supposed to do and operated uh, the county system or the district system. Um, this year we've taken in, um, they've added Spring Lake um, to their district um, and we're um, going through the process to make sure that that doesn't um, negatively impact um, the district and so far it hasn't. For Mr. Gibson. Uh, Council Member Hare. Okay, uh, Mr. Gibson, uh, and I was trying to find that sixty thousand in in here, so that only came from you. It's not on anything in the docket here. So, 
you said that that is a form of a service agreement for management and were you if i heard that correctly and were you speaking on for cumberland county because you kind of I, I don't remember you you were very pacific on that sixty thousand, unless i just didn't see it and i was trying to find it in the diet it's, but it's, it's on page 10 item 18. But what, what, that, ahead, what that pays for um, is the administrative costs, what um, the city manager, the assistant city manager, um, the finance department, the purchasing department, if they touched it, then that, that funding would then um, offset the cost of them dealing with um, the management of the county's recreational system. And that payment came from? The five cent tax that they okay. would then okay um, okay and i know you're not asking for any form of a decision this evening but, okay i see it i see it all right thank thank you uh, mayor pro tem thank you council member hare i don't see any hands up oh thank you council member jensen um thank you mayor pro tem yes, so i guess my question that i would ask um I, and I appreciate you bringing this so we could look through it because it was done in 2004 and we basically haven't changed anything from it since then. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So I, I would like for us to take action of some sort that the county and the city sit down and discuss and revise this. And if it's the same thing, that's fine. But we have to go through it. And this is an example of why we have to go through it. Number 8A, this, um, the city director shall prepare a proposed budget, budget each year for the consolation department that identifies parks and recreation expenses for both city and recreation district areas. The budget shall include projected operating expenses for J.P. Riddle Stadium, including the operating expense components supported by the county recreation tax district revenues. Nobody owns that anymore, correct? Um, I think Fevel Tech does. Yes, you're correct. So it's still in there? Yes. So what I will say is I think that as a council, and I don't know if we can do that tonight or we need to do it at a meeting, that somebody has to go over and look at this. It goes back to the policy committee when we started looking and we had policies that were older than I am. And, that, and I'm old. So I, I think you that you are not old. Well, there was there was a policy that you could not smoke on the diocese. Well, I'm glad we don't do that no more. So uh, that that's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's good, but I think we need to go through it. I don't think that that's an unreasonable request. Thank you. Do you have uh, Councilmember Ingram? Thank you. Um, just for a point of uh, some clarification, uh, Council Member Jensen, I do believe in our budget work session last week, this came up in the discussion, and I do know that there were some concerns, and as I stated in that meeting, I was um, virtually moving around. I do know that there were some concerns, and so would you be amenable to... I do believe that we need to get caught up with the times in all of our policies and processes. I do believe that. And so would you be amenable to having staff present what would be the best way to move forward? Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm asking that because one a good point was brought up um, in last week's meeting about we're already in a, in a bit of an uncomfortable position with the county. And so going even further to say, well, we want to change this agreement, I, I do want to be mindful of that. Um, so I would, would love to know that, you know, if you are amenable, could staff come back about what they would recommend the best way to move forward, and then we make a decision off of that. And if you're okay with that, I'll second that motion. That is exactly what I was asking for. Um, that we could, that staff in the county, our city staff and county staff could go through it. And it's like I said, I'm not saying we need to change anything. We just need to update it to the times. All right, Councilmember Hondros. 
Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I'm just in agreement with my colleagues. Uh, as a general rule, any strategic plan or uh, document that hasn't been revised in five years is worthy of at least to look at whether a revision is required or not. So I'm in agreement. Thank you. All right. Um, any more for round one? Now round two. Um, I saw hands for Council Member Ingram and Council Member Jensen. All right. Council Member yep, and Jensen. I'll second. Uh, Council Member Banks McLaughlin, do you have a question or comment? Yes, round one, Council Member Banks McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, before we move forward, um, when, when is the next city county liaison meeting? 21 I, or 22? 20, 20, because I 21 think. 21 June. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Okay, I was going to say, I think that need to be a conversation that we have with the city and county before our staff look into that information like we need to sit down with because it don't make sense for our staff to do the work and then try to come back to county and they're not in support of what we're trying to do so I think we should at least try to come into a common ground with the county to see what we can you know how we can work all right council member Jensen round two so the the motion that I'm making when we were at the meeting this is how we kind of discussed it that staff would talk to staff and then come back to the to the meeting to talk about it um, because um, it, it's it, it we have to give them a year time and it's not right. like we're saying we want to do that we're just saying will staffs get together and then come back to us so if I could I'd like to make a motion yes, that we um, ask staff to um, have a meeting with the county about getting our agreement up to date and um, come back with um, their recommendations for the county and the city together, um, their recommendations. Second. Motion by Council Member Jensen, second by Council Member Ingram, now in discussion. Um, is that a discussion, Council Member? All right, all right. All right, I don't, uh, I don't see any hands on my screen. All right. Um, there. All right. Very good. Uh, let's ask for your vote. Uh, please vote. Uh, thank you, Council. That vote is unanimous. Motion to adjourn. Who's that? Hondros. That's right. Does not have to be a second.